Coaches, welcome back to round two. Today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about challenges that we can expect in this work supporting female athletes. We'll share some thoughts on how we might approach those challenges. Uh, but first, one more quick physiology lesson, or this may be review for some, and I'm going to connect this physiology piece with um, today's sport norms, kind of common ways of doing things in sport today. I'm going to share this. This is actually, um, this is a screenshot from my phone. This is a strength training from a strength training app that I use to design my own training. Uh, I can program in my sport and my goals and it designs things for me, but I will preface by saying that I do modify what it tells me to do. And I'm about to describe why. So this, uh, illustrates a common training model that's used both in strength training and sports specific training. And what it's showing is how training load, if you look over to the left, you can see how training load or intensity progressively increases throughout a few weeks. And then it shows build, build, build. And then in week four or showing week eight, that's called um, an unload or a deload week. And that's just, that's a recovery week. So where your load is a lot lighter. And this is really commonly used. Most collegiate teams use a model like this. And this model is great for male physiology uh, because male the male hormonal landscape or sex hormone levels in a male body are pretty stable or flat throughout a month's time. Um, for a female body, though, this is what a four-week hormone cycle looks like. And you can see that it's, it's far from stable or far from flat. And you have these sex hormone levels that are fluctuating quite a bit throughout four weeks. And this matters uh, because... As you see those spikes or those hormone levels change, that catalyzes a number of physiological changes inside the body, which impacts everything from how food is metabolized and how fuel is burned during exercise, thermoregulation, so how the, how the body will dissipate heat, um, training response, psychological and emotional state. And in the second half, um, you know, that's also when a female can experience problematic symptoms, including pain, which can be severe for some, and high levels of fatigue. Um, so as we juxtapose these two images, two key takeaways that I hope you will hold in the back of your mind. One, uh, the training models that we're using today were designed for male physiology. They were designed for that flat hormonal landscape. Two, um, these models really have no regard for what is physiologically taking place inside a female athlete's body week after week and month after month. And practically speaking, uh, what that means is by using these training models, a female athlete maybe or often is training at their or training at their hardest when they feel at their worst. And importantly, they may be training lightest or unloading when they feel at their best. Um, so it's reasonable to question if this is the best way to do things, yet it's still how most are doing it. Um, so I want you to hold that in the back of your mind, um, but I also want you to zoom out and we're going to consider even a bigger picture. And that's that we have these deeply ingrained ways of doing things in sport and we tend not to question them um, because we, we've been made to believe that they're scientifically based models. And they are scientifically based models. They're just based exclusively around the needs of male physiology uh, because that's who the research has been conducted on. Um, and that's the case in sports science research. It's also the case in medicine and medical research. So for the females or parents listening to this, you'll want to keep that sobering fact in the back of your mind um, as you consider your own health and health care or those that you're looking out that care of those you're looking out for. So here's the good news, though. I will share some good news where uh, the tides are turning. There is more research being done on female bodies uh, and there is growing awareness around the need to redesign things to meet um, those those physiological needs. So pivoting back to what we can do right now as we support female athletes, quick review, we can offer uh, resources and make sure that female athletes are informed. We can normalize the conversation and take the edge off the discomfort that is associated with topics of women's health and menstrual cycle health. And then three, really the heart of today's session is we do need to reinforce both the learning and positive messaging for female athletes around their health and well-being. 
And that reinforcement is necessary because we are trying to change deeply ingrained norms and sport traditions and beliefs. So really we're looking at trying to shift entire mindsets or ways of thinking and ways of knowing. Um, and that requires patient yet persistent reinforcement, which can feel messy and it can feel uncomfortable. Uh, so I want, actually wanna share a short clip of a former student. Uh, his name is Broderick. He's given me permission to share this. A little bit of context, he's an alum from our Master of Education Coaching Preparation Program at the University of Washington. As part of that program, students take a sport performance course that includes a female athlete unit. And a couple of years ago, I was really curious to know what our former students were doing with this information and how they were applying it into their coaching and into their leadership. Um, so I interviewed them, which was really fun. And here's uh, one of the things that Broderick shared is he's talking about communicating with female athletes. And now I think having the knowledge that I do from our program, I would most likely say, yeah, of course, let me help you with this. I, I might not have all the answers right now, but let me go find them. And I want to help you because now I feel comfortable understanding that if an athlete comes to me with this kind of a topic, they most likely want to trust you or already do trust you and feel comfortable enough to have that conversation. So I share this uh, specific clip because I think it illustrates uh, how he's working through an entire mindset change. This isn't just about learning a little bit of information. Um, he's rethinking his role as a coach. He's rethinking the way he responds to female athletes and the way he communicates with them. And as all of this is happening, um, you can tell, you can feel that he is still uncomfortable. And he's a year and a half into this. This interview took place a year and a half after he first learned the content. So he's still um, working through that and he's still experiencing some of that discomfort of not having all the answers and figuring out how to communicate in new ways. But at the same time, like you can feel his commitment to this because he's thinking about that bigger picture of doing things in a way that's equitable for female athletes. Um, to give a bit more context from his background, he at this uh, when he was in our program, he was coaching a strength and conditioning coach in a Power Five university. So he's in a heavily resourced um, elite level sport program. Really, he had a background in exercise science yet he had never learned about female athlete physiology uh, before coming into our program. I'm gonna share one more clip. He's now teaching high school health. And here he is. Like such, a, such a blind spot for me. So whenever I have the opportunity or get to talk to young coaches or get to talk to my high school boys, I always try and think about the lens that they come at, come through, right? The lens that they're using and how to widen that lens so that they don't have the blind spots. We like to talk about, we like to unpack blind spots in our program. Um, I share this, he's, he's bravely taking this into high school classrooms, which I think is awesome. I will say he's in a private school, so he has a little more flexibility in what he can do. Uh, but he's turning into that discomfort. And um, I want everyone to kind of just think of this, of that bravery when you are facing the challenges that you face and the, the challenges you experience are really going to depend on your sport culture, the developmental stage of the athletes you're working with, and of course, um, the attitudes of the leadership surrounding you. So you may be in environments where you face pushback or dismissal um, as you share this information or you try to implement it. And really all of that is manifesting from the same root, um, which is that this content is unfamiliar to most people. Um, so I encourage you to be patient yet persistent, keeping in mind that those around you are likely working through a shift in their mindset as well. Um, and that includes female athletes. Uh, so they will need reinforcement from us. Uh, they will need consistent reminders to pay attention to and prioritize their health. And many of them will be learning how to do that for the first time. So it needs to become routine for them. And one simple way for us to reinforce attention to, to health uh, for them is post the handouts that we shared or make those visible for the athletes and then just carve out like five minutes of team time per week that's dedicated to their reflecting on their health, 
journaling about it uh, and tracking their cycle and tracking associated symptoms. Um, and this is for their, this is for them. It's not, they're not reporting back to us or anyone else. They're just holding this for themselves. And over time that will enable them to anticipate and plan for, and hopefully even manage some of the problematic symptoms they may be experiencing. And of course, they'll also be monitoring their uh, cycle rhythms to ensure that they're getting the nutrition that they need. And by carving out team time, um, you're messaging and reinforcing to them that health is important and it should be prioritized. And you're also supporting them in developing skillfulness and being able to read and interpret their body's feedback and then respond to their body's needs. Um, I call this attunement. It's helpful to think of attunement as a skill. And as all coaches know, skill development requires time and it also requires patience. Um, so that's one strategy that you can use to reinforce this with female athletes. Another challenge coaches face is dismiss dismissal or pushback from doctors or leadership. So we've shared a resource that you can share with others um, and that athletes and parents can even take to their doctor. It's a clinical assessment tool that was published by the International Olympic Committee. And um, that's in your resources for this week. Okay, as we wrap up, I leave you with this. We lose far more women and girls from sport than we do boys and men. Uh, by your being here and taking part in this work, you are taking steps to disrupt that trend. Um, and as we continue this work, we need community and support around us uh, because this work is not easy. That's why I spend an entire session talking about the challenges. Uh, so find your allies, build an ecosystem of support around you. And I invite you to end by watching the short video of our alumni voices um, who share how they're going about this work and supporting female athletes. They're good to end on because they bring optimism. Um, and I also hope it will help you feel a sense of community and connectedness with the other coaches and leaders who are out there trailblazing. All right, coaches, thank you for taking part in this um, and for all the work that you do to support young athletes.